And, and you'd be very relieved to know that John Burkow is here, so you're not having to put up with me. But I was asked just to say a few words, because not all of you will know the things that John Burkow has actually achieved in his time in Parliament, but also as Speaker of the House of Commons. And it's with very great pleasure that I'm here tonight to welcome Right Honourable John Burkow, who uh, is, as Matt said, going to give some thoughts, not just on the renewal and regeneration of the parliamentary building, but what should be going on in and out of that building, and how we redesign for democracy post-Brexit in an entirely changed situation, which is really unknown and is something, as we were just discussing with John before we came onto the platform, a, a, a major challenge. Jo John Burkow is quite a remarkable uh, politician, not just because he's prepared to take on government and uh, allow backbenchers to have their say, which, which he does, but because he's literally opened up the role of Speaker and Speaker's House and Parliament in entirely new ways. So very briefly, from 30 years of campaigning to get a nursery in the House of Commons, John Burkow, as Speaker, accelerated that so that we actually have one. Um, it's not just for children, by the way, it's for dissident MPs as well. Um, the whole issue of diversity within the Palace of Westminster, not just the commission that John took over and chaired in relation to access to public life, but also the staffing of the Palace of Westminster and the House of Commons in particular. The way in which John has uh, made it possible for the education service in the Palace of Westminster to expand dramatically and is now on an entirely different footing uh, to what existed before but also in terms of reaching out, as with this evening, across the country to give time that speakers previously didn't to engaging with the public, to giving a perspective of what's taking place in the House of Commons, the challenges there, but also how it relates to wider participative democracy. Just two or three quick things, if you'll forgive me, which are to do with John and I, because I've got to know him extremely well uh, I didn't know him all that well when he was in Theresa May's shadow team when I was Education and Employment Secretary and he was on the opposing benches. I didn't actually know until I looked this up that he moved seamlessly from uh, shadowing me to working with Anne Widdicombe in the shadow Home Office team, a task that no right-thinking man would want to take on, uh, it has to be said. But, and this is a really important uh, aspect in terms of my mind, back in, 19, uh, back in 2008, John Burko took on the challenge of a major review into communication, uh, language, uh, and uh, the issues around speaking skills for children with severe special needs. John has personal knowledge of this. And I want to say, John, the work you did and the impact that had taken up, uh, as it happens, by Ed Balls was really important to so many families and to so many children, and I'm personally very grateful. Often people don't know what the Speaker of the House of Commons does. He takes on those sorts of tasks. He took on continuing reform, begun, it has to be said, back in the 1960s when Professor Bernard Crick uh, published his The Reform of Parliament back in 1968, which led to the creation of select committees and the work of Michael Foote as leader of the House. All these things are taken for granted, but they involve someone being prepared to give a lead, and uh, John Burke has been prepared to do that. With no more ado, please give a good, warm Sheffield welcome to the Right Honourable John Burke, Speaker of the House of Commons. Thank you very much. David, I'm bound to say to you and to all ladies and gentlemen here assembled that 
Having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> uh, whether you'll feel the same way at the end of my remarks is a matter for legitimate speculation and conjecture. But I do, at the risk of this becoming a mutual admiration society, want to pay a very particular and heartfelt tribute to two people before I further proceed. First, to you, David, because in a career of public service in local government and then in parliament, spanning more than 45 years, you have been dedicated, principled, and transformative on a scale of which most people could not even begin to dream. You have been, and you remain, a consummate public servant, and in my judgment, ladies and gentlemen, and I do have quite a good vantage point from the chair, an inspiration to people, particularly, but not only, to people with disabilities, contemplating a career on the public stage. It is a commonplace, ladies and gentlemen, in Parliament to note that some people are, by temperament, disposition, or capacity, men or women of government, that is to say, executive practitioners, others are men or women of Parliament. It is, believe me, rare to come across and to have the pleasure of developing a friendship with someone who is both an extremely effective man of government and someone always not merely comfortable with, but positively reveling in the parliamentary theatre and the challenge of engagement with alternative views. So David, for all of those things you deserve huge credit, and on a personal level, in good times and bad, I've had the huge ballast, and it has been a huge ballast, of your personal friendship and support during the time I did that review on speech and language services, and throughout my time as speaker, you have been an absolute brick, and I want to thank you. Secondly, my friends, perhaps I can thank Matt Flinders because we've come to know each other well over the last seven or eight years, and I admit that I have a natural bias in his favour because he's an academic who believes not merely in the academic study of politics, although that is hugely important and evolving all the time, but in the profession of politics. So instead of starting from the vantage point that we're all useless or worse, he starts from the premise that people who come into public life might at least first be assumed to have good motives and to be seeking after a better deal for their constituents and the country as a whole. When you add into the mix the fact that Matt Flinders is both a very accomplished academic and a brilliant communicator, that is a combination of which he, and very importantly Sheffield University, can be incredibly proud. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to be here at Sheffield University. It does have a richly deserved reputation for its academic excellence in many spheres, but especially, if I may say so, in government and politics. That status started to be acquired with the impact that Sir Bernard Crick had on his discipline while a professor here, and it is so right to celebrate through this lecture his success and the building blocks which he put in place. Being invited to do so, however, does put a certain pressure on the person chosen for the task to produce something worthy of an association, however distant and tangential, with Sir Bernard. I will do my best 
with this undoubtedly daunting challenge. I want to do so, ladies and gentlemen, by aspiring to link two seemingly very separate matters. The first is an appreciation of the legacy of Sir Bernard Crick, particularly from the perspective of a practicing politician, which, even though politically impartial as speaker, I cannot deny that I am. The second is the blueprint for the restoration and renewal of an iconic building, namely the Palace of Westminster itself, which, if all necessary approval is secured, will take place over the next decade. The connection between the intellectual output of a person who is no longer with us and an act of architecture and construction that has yet to be initiated, never mind completed, might not strike many in this audience, at least at this stage, as credible, let alone obvious. Yet by the time that I sit down and submit myself to questions on any subject which you care to put to me, I hope to have progressed in making an argument that the transformation of the physical character of Parliament is an endeavour of which Sir Bernard Crick would have heartily approved. To set the context for such a perhaps sweeping and, let us be frank, ultimately unprovable assertion, let me start by setting out why, as a practicing politician, with a strong interest in the intellectual analysis of politics, I consider Sir Bernard to have been such a giant, indeed a colossus in his field. The first reason is that he had an unusually holistic view about what politics is. When he came to Sheffield in 1963, when, at the risk of offering too much information, I was myself experiencing the joys of breastfeeding by Mrs. Burko Senior. To assume his chair, his title was Professor of Political Theory and Institutions. The coupling of those two themes, theory and institutions, was then, and from my own experience, is now unconventional the more orthodox approach within the study of politics was to see political institutions and political theory as quite separate areas of specialism, which were likely to attract quite different sorts of people and minds. Political institutions as a discipline constituted the study of the structure and systems by which politics would be undertaken at various times and in various countries, and its external reference point beyond the sphere of politics itself would normally be that of history. Political theory, by contrast, involved the study of the arguments and ideas around which politics might be organized at various times and in various countries, and its external reference point beyond the sphere of politics itself would most naturally be philosophy. Institutions and theory were thus, if not exactly the equivalent of sheep and goats, broadly regarded as approaches to politics which ran along different lines of academic track. Sir Bernard Crick clearly did not believe this. His lengthy, lifelong list of publications happily darted between political theory and political institutions with much else included as well. He clearly took the view which he sometimes explicitly expressed, that theory, devoid of any institutional element, ran the risk of being absurdly abstract. While a study of institutions, which did not recognize the role of ideas in influencing them, would turn that branch of inquiry into a bland production line. The truth is that in the real world, political theory and political institutions are nothing close to oil and water. They are more akin to gin and tonic, always there together, but in varying measurements. The second aspect of the Crick approach to politics that I would like to highlight is his approval of it. His masterpiece, In Defense of Politics, was a classic of its time. And although so much has changed in the world of politics and the world more broadly, 
it remains a formidable text today, some 54 years after it was first published, and more than 30 years after I myself read it as an undergraduate at the University of Essex. To reinforce my first point, it also crosses the boundary between institutions and theory so regularly as to make a mockery of the notion that such a border might be there. It is a testament to the reality that politics is by its very nature frequently messy and complicated, and that it requires some tolerance of a realm in which different forces will have different truths at the heart of their belief systems and policy agendas. Politics is emphatically not a sterile science. Politics is about facts, but it is not about facts alone. And specifically, and in particular, it is not a competition between facts to establish which of them is the most relevant in a certain area of political controversy. Sir Bernard argued vigorously and to my mind, as a practicing politician who spends his working life seated in the House of Commons observing the actions and the words of other politicians, entirely correctly, that in politics it is impossible to divorce facts from values, however much people might seek to convince themselves that their decisions were simply being guided by the evidence. In the easy cases, facts might indeed be able to impose themselves in that fashion. In almost all of the hard cases, however, facts interact with values, and frequently it is values which emerge triumphant. Not only did Professor Crick understand this, he deemed it to be an argument in defense of politics. He asserted that politics is best conducted amid the open canvassing of rival interests as well as rival ideas. Hence, he sought to set out a series of what might be described as soft values that he deemed to be political virtues. These virtues would act as an informal set of guidelines as to how politics should be practiced within the reality of the messy and complicated terrain that he had identified. These political virtues included such key features as prudence, conciliation, compromise, variety, adaptability, and liveliness. This collection of favored attributes indicates that Sir Bernard was at heart a reformer more than a radical or a revolutionary. The politics that he defended was about allowing competing interests in society and alternative ideas to find, if not always an accommodation with each other, then a series of structures in which their differences would be managed. In all this, to repeat, he saw values as being at the absolute heart of both the theory and the institutions of politics. As a practicing politician, I think he was absolutely right in his assessment. The third and final reason why I wish to commend Sir Bernard's outstanding work to you is that he was very interested, ladies and gentlemen, in Parliament and Parliaments. On the more orthodox view of what a professor of political theory should write about, this would be deemed idiosyncratic. Mercifully, no one had the courage to tell Sir Bernard this, not that I suspect he would have taken much notice of that line of thinking if it had been offered to him. Sir Bernard was interested in parliaments because he was interested in politics, and he knew that parliaments were important to politics. The claim that this was territory into which a theorist should not wish to tread would have struck him as surreal. His tome, Reform of Parliament, published in 1964, has once again stood the test of time, even if, entirely understandably, it was very much the product of a particular set of political issues that had acquired prominence by the early 1960s. Sir Bernard divined that the rise of political parties had, as a practical matter, changed the constitutional reality that scholars of politics in the Victorian era, such as Bajo and Dicey, had perceived and which had influenced the status 
and the conduct of Parliament. In this new era, Sir Bernard contended, members of Parliament should be full-time professionals, remunerated appropriately, benefit from enhanced research support, and willing to supplement their activities in the debating chamber by operating through specialist committees. This is an analysis which has been at the centre of the argument about Parliament's purpose ever since. I suspect that if he were able to be here tonight, Sir Bernard would be pleased about quite a few of the reforms made in the House of Commons over the past seven years, notably the election of select committee chairs directly by the whole House, but would insist that more could still be done. On that contention, it will not surprise you to hear, I would once more agree with him enthusiastically. His interest in Parliament did not end in the 1960s. In the 1980s, while in nominal retirement, he became a passionate advocate. A passionate advocate not just for the principle of a Scottish Parliament, but for it to take a distinctive form instead of being simply Westminster with Tartan. He was interested in how it would be structured, what it would be like, and the nature of its relationship with the citizenry. He appreciated not only that a building could be a political symbol, but that how it was built was not simply a matter of construction or of design, rather that it could have consequences for political practice. So let me summarize. My own take on the Crick thesis of politics, crudely put, is this. Politics is a holistic concept, not a concept divided into theory and institutions. Politics matters. Values are at their heart. Certain virtues determine the character of political conduct. Parliaments matter in politics. Which brings me on to what in physical terms would be the most dramatic transformation of the Palace of Westminster in almost 200 years, namely the restoration and renewal blueprint. In this section of my remarks this evening, I will draw heavily on the conclusions and recommendations of those who have examined this issue in minute and laborious detail. My objective is to set those conclusions and recommendations in a framework of arguments and ideas that I think Sir Bernard would embrace. The first point to make is that this project is a matter of necessity and not of institutional vanity. The Palace of Westminster, a masterpiece of Victorian and medieval architecture and engineering, faces an impending crisis which we cannot responsibly ignore. It is impossible to state with certainty when it will happen, but there is a substantial and growing risk of either a single catastrophic event, such as a major fire, or a succession of incremental failures in essential systems, which would then lead to Parliament no longer being able to occupy the palace. The situation is as stark and dramatic as that. The issue is not structural as such. Although extensive erosion and water damage to the stonework are visible throughout the palace, there is no significant risk of the foundations failing or of walls or roofs collapsing in the manner of some Hollywood movie. The main problem lies in the building's mechanical and engineering services. The vast, and I do mean vast, network of pipes, cables and machinery that carry heat, ventilation, air conditioning, power, water, data, and other essential services around the building. Many of these systems were last replaced in the 1940s as part of repairs required after Parliament was bombed in 1941 and reached the end of their projected life in the 1970s and 1980s. This patch and mend approach, which has seen the building through the decades since, is no longer sustainable. Intervention on a much larger scale is now required. Unless an intensive program of major remedial work is undertaken soon, it is likely that the building will become uninhabitable and could do so in a manner and according to a time scale beyond our control. Put simply, Parliament as a building, but crucially also 
as a forum for our democratic discourse, has been living on borrowed time. The last grains of sand are beginning to run out. No one would want to undertake the sort of exercise which we are of necessity contemplating out of amusement or experimentation. This is not a case of politicians itching to reach for the public purse in order to improve their own surroundings. The heroic efforts of various ingenious senior officials over decades have put the moment of truth off for an astonishingly long time. That moment of truth is now with us. The second point is that the recommended option is the most disruptive to us in the short term, but offers the best chance of a permanent solution in the longer term. It is certainly not an easy option. The central question of how to deliver this massive program of work has come down to a choice between three options. The first option is seeking to sustain the work of Parliament in the middle of a building site for several decades. The second option would be to proceed in two phases by renovating first one house, then the other. The third and final option, the Big Bang, if you like, means moving in a single phase by vacating the building completely for a few years and tackling the whole site all at once. The extensive evidence that has been accumulated to date shows that option one carries a very high burden of risk and the possibility that the disruption caused to the work of Parliament by this type of building programme could become intolerable before the entire programme of restoration and renewal was completed. In this scenario, that program would probably not be realized until the 2050s or 2060s. In other words, something could go disastrously wrong in the intervening three, four, or five decades. A potentially big cost, financially and in terms of disruption, would be long deferred, but definitely incurred. The second option, dealing with the two houses one at a time, could turn out to be the worst of all worlds. This is because it would be necessary, first of all, to construct a new network of mechanical and electrical systems above ground to deliver services to the occupied second half of the building before stripping out the old systems. It would involve much of the disruption and inconvenience of option one, with each house in turn having to operate around a busy and noisy building site in the other half of the building. The practical difficulties, as well as the security and health and safety problems, of even one house operating on the same site as a heavy metal work zone for several years can scarcely be overstated. In addition to this, Parliament would still have to acquire and fit out temporary accommodation for one house first, and then adapt it again for the other house afterwards. This would include not just the chamber for each house, but also everything else in the part of the palace occupied by that house, including offices for members and staff, the library, procedural offices, and other facilities. This option, despite some superficial appeal, therefore carries high risks to the business of Parliament and our democratic proceedings, and seems impractical. Which means that what might look like the boldest option, ladies and gentlemen, is actually the most prudent and pragmatic. Option three has been put forward as the best option. It would mean the House of Commons temporarily relocating to Richmond House, the current Department of Health, and the House of Lords temporarily transporting to the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre. This is a huge amount of upheaval for which to volunteer. Yet it would allow the works to be completed in the shortest possible time frame, probably involve the lowest capital cost, and likely represent the best value for money. In terms both of methods and of milestones, the restoration and renewal project offers us the chance to fashion a progressive parliament. It is too early, this is not the occasion, and I am not the person to make detailed proposals. But let me this evening offer eight examples of how we should be progressive in our thinking. First, let us invite contractors to tell us what opportunities they will give to apprentices to work on the project. Second, 
Small and medium-sized enterprises should not be overlooked in the tendering process, but given a chance to enjoy a slice of the action if they can add value to the work. Third, social enterprises are a growing force, rightly so, and should be given the opportunity to show what they can offer, be it in design, construction, or services. Fourth, let's look to the regions for their input, be it in the supply of labor or materials, for example, or indeed, and I want to underline this, in periodically hosting high-profile debates between leaders if we have decanted for a number of years from the Westminster estate. Aside from gladiatorial contests, restoration and renewal might provide our select committees with the impetus and opportunity to venture more, they do it a bit, but to venture more into the big cities in pursuit of their inquiries. As a brief aside in relation to my previous four points, the Public Services Social Value Act 2012 provides for public commissioners to take into account social, in economic, and environmental impact as well as value for money when awarding contracts. My parliamentary colleague, Chris White, MP, and my former parliamentary colleague, Hazel Blears, were the driving forces behind this legislation, and it is now facilitating responsible business practice, increased spend with social enterprises, and supply chains which support local communities and keeping money in local areas. Furthermore, in November 2014, a year after I pledged to put buy social at the heart of parliament, we became an accredited bi-social organization in recognition of our commitment to social, environmental, and economic value in the procurement process. These are examples of how Parliament is already walking the walk, but restoration and renewal provides the opportunity to take longer strides in these areas. Fifth, our parliamentary archives are at risk of deterioration. They will need to be relocated before any decant, and in the medium to long term, their conservation, display, and accessibility to visitors and researchers could, and in my view should, be greatly improved. At present, my preferred way forward would be for a Westminster location combined with much enhanced regional programming of events and outreach by archives representatives across the UK. If we get it right, this could be a real legacy benefit and a prize worth seeking for future generations. Sixth, Professor Sarah Childs of the University of Bristol recently launched her report entitled The Good Parliament, a roadmap to a more diverse, inclusive, and gender-sensitive parliament. Many of the recommendations are well beyond the remit of the restoration and renewal project. Others, however, including better provision for those with caring responsibilities, improved disabled access, and more female-orientated spaces could be well served by it. Furthermore, during decant, when colleagues will necessarily operate in a temporary alternative chamber, different ways of doing politics might usefully be trialled. Seventh, we could open Parliament up to and offer a much better experience for many more visitors beyond the roughly one million per year who currently come. Our digital, interactive, state-of-the-art education center opened in July 2015, allowing 100,000 young people to visit Parliament. But over time, with careful planning, we should be able to add to that figure that would enable far more people to come to Parliament to learn about the journey and the painful journey it was to the rights and representation that we enjoy today. What's more, as part of a revamped Parliament, we could establish a dedicated visitors' centre, perhaps housing an exhibition or parliamentary museum amongst other possible attractions. We should explore all the options for allowing parts of the extraordinary House of Commons library to be thrown open to scholars and students. 
we should encourage older people to visit us as well and strive to build on what is already a much more exciting range of tours. Eighth, we should use the chance to entrench a step change in technology, better to connect the house with the outside world, and so then implement many of the ideas which were recommended by the Digital Democracy Commission, which I established in November 2013, and which reported in January 2015. We should be bold on that front too. In all of the above, the only limitations upon us are those which we allow to constrain our ambitions, our imagination, and our intentions. Moreover, in shaping our own thoughts on the look, the feel, the scope, and the potential of a parliament which is for the people, let's ask them for theirs. There is ample scope for a big national conversation with people of all age groups, parts of the country, and walks of life about the kinds of attributes they want a renewed parliament to exhibit. I believe that Sir Bernard Crick would have shared my enthusiasm because he would have seen the physical reconstruction of Parliament not as an end in itself, but as a means to a much bigger end, namely enhancing the accessibility of our democracy and widening the numbers involved in the conversation that is democracy. I think it would have suited his pursuit of a holistic notion of what politics is rather than the silos of theory and institutions. He would have appreciated how those who have come to their conclusions and reached their recommendations have done their work and would have seen within their painstaking process all of the soft virtues, prudence, conciliation, variety, adaptability, liveliness, that he thought it so important to encourage in political dialogue. As a man who contended that Parliament and parliaments matter, he would have concurred that what we do with our parliament as a structure has wider and more important implications. My sense is that he would have loved to have been part of this brave but unavoidable act of experimentation. Above all, he more than anyone else would have seen that this discussion about the future of Parliament is not merely about facts, but also about values. We should value our democracy. To value it properly, however, we should not merely respect its past, but make the changes required for it to be of maximum possible value in the future. In this, the theatres of political theory and political institutions really must be fused. It has been a privilege to make this case in Sir Bernard Crick's name. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.